All right, thank you all for attending. Uh, this is What Consumers Want, Current and Future Trends in the Video Revolution. We've got a great group of panelists here to talk about uh, consumer trends and other trends in the industry. So let's kick it off by uh, having the panelists introduce themselves. Nick. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Nick Colsey, uh, business development for Sony Electronics, uh, working mainly on um, smart TVs and uh, bringing um, OTT and other types of app uh, services to, uh, to Sony TVs. Hi, my name is Anthony Laser. Uh, I'm uh, the content VP for North America for Daily Motion. Uh, Daily Motion is a video platform owned by Vivendi. Um, we have been around for 11 years. Um, and what my team does in particular is uh, content acquisition and uh, partner management uh, for North American uh, content partners, um, mostly you know, media companies. Hi, my name is Richard Au. I work at Amazon and lead a content acquisition team for Amazon Channels. Amazon Channels is uh, a new business um, within Amazon Video, and it's highly complementary to the uh, other businesses um, of Amazon today. Um, Prime Video, which includes Amazon original programming like Transparent and Man in the High Castle, as well as um, licensed content and programming from third parties. Um, as well as our um, transactional video on demand service where you can rent and buy content. And so we started Amazon Channels um, last December, and uh, we have over 75 uh, video subscription services that are available on our platform today. And um, it, you, as a consumer, use the Amazon Video app to consume all of those subscriptions. Um, and our app's on hundreds of devices um, in the living room and on mobile. Great, and I'm Jonathan Hurd, a director with Altman, Valandry and Company. We're a 120 person strategy consulting firm that focuses completely on technology, media, and telecom. And to kick things off, we are going to take a look at some consumer trends that uh, we found from our annual consumer video survey. We've been doing for seven years now. The survey covers a wide range of topics from subscribership uh, interest in pay TV channels, online video usage, uh, OTT services, and other factors. And it's a big survey in that we had 5,000 respondents across the US, so very good sample size. And this year, we focused on skinny bundles. So this is a trend that we're seeing in the industry. And let's, uh, let's dive in to look at some of the findings from the survey. <clears throat> Whoops, sorry. There we go, I think. Yes. <laughs> In the video distribution industry, it, there's been a, a model that has been around for many years of having lots of channels, lots of channels that are available live. But now we're starting to see new trends in that traditional model uh, change and adapt. One thing we're seeing is new entrants like Sony PlayStation View and Sling TV, which are true uh, live channel offers, but available over the top, meaning available over the public internet. Uh, we're also seeing traditional providers like Dish coming out with skinnier lineups of channels, Dish Flex Packs at $35. And then we're seeing new entrants. Uh, Hulu announced that it will be coming out next year with a live pay TV channel offer delivered over the top, and uh, YouTube as well. So there have been a, a number of different um, developments there. Direct TV now also, so Direct TV will be delivered over the top, a version of it, and it was in the press that this would have about 100 channels and be about $35. So very aggressive pricing. So this is creating a lot of disruption in the industry. But what's at the root from a consumer perspective of some of this uh, disruption? Well, one thing is over the past five years, and we just went back to our survey results in 2011, uh, we asked how often do you watch TV shows and movies during their normal broadcast time on pay TV? And the dark bar is 2011, the blue bar is this past July when we fielded the survey. 
you could see that in younger segments, it's roughly the same as it was five years ago in terms of the percentage saying that they watch at least weekly. But in older segments, it has dropped off. And this is, again, consumer reported. Uh, so it, it may not line up exactly with what Nielsen or others would say, but there's been a decline in live TV viewing. By the way, I see some of you taking photos. If you give me your card afterwards, I'll be happy to, you, you could take photos, but if you give me your card afterwards, I'm happy to forward you uh, the slides. <clears throat> and so we've seen a drop off to some extent in those who subscribe to pay TV versus those who are cord cutters, meaning they used to have live pay TV service but canceled it, or cord nevers, those who never had it. Overall, the decline in pay TV subscribership has been about a percentage point a year or maybe even a bit less uh, over the past um, five, six years. So it's not, the sky is not falling, but it's definitely, there's been erosion in subscribership. So we, um, one of the pain points is, are there a lot of channels that people have in their subscription or are almost like forced to subscribe to, but really don't watch? So we asked um, uh, the question, posed the, the statement, I am wasting money because my pay TV service includes many TV channels that my household does not watch. You can see it was older segments that tended to agree with this more, about two thirds of those over 45, a little bit less agreement in younger segments. Uh, but it, clearly, this is a pain point. And in our survey, we asked across 150 different channels. So we won't get into it in depth, but we have a simulator that can simulate any combination of 150 different channels at any price point at any from any provider with other product features as well and determine what the consumer take rate would likely be. We asked people for each of those 150 channels to say, is this a must have? Is this a somewhat interested or is this a not interested? Whoops. And you can see the number of must have channels uh, at the bottom of this stack bar chart here. Um, higher in the 25 to 44 age range um, and compared to the number that they say they watch in a typical week, it's about double which does make some sense. There are things, certain channels you might watch only seasonally because of sports, or maybe you watch a, a certain like AMC network only when Better Call Saul is on or something along those lines. But, um, but you could see that in older segments, this fits that pain point of I'm paying for channels or wasting money because my household doesn't watch them. <clears throat> in those older segments, uh, they actually say they do watch fewer channels and have fewer must-haves. Now, what's, uh, what has been happening as, as a result or, uh, you know, uh, contra to the traditional pay TV usage, people have been watching more over the top. So versus five years ago, across all age ranges, those who say they watch TV shows or movies on the internet at least weekly has gone up fairly significantly. <clears throat> 55 plus, a little less, but in other segments, it's, it's gone up to you know, roughly 80% of those <clears throat> under age 35. And also as a, <clears throat> as a result of that, uh, younger consumers are relying more on these online services as a place to discover new content or to find things to watch. So when we asked what form of video you're more likely to turn on without having a plan, <clears throat> those uh, younger segments, more than half of those under um, 35 actually said they turned to online video services rather than traditional TV. And then the one issue or one of several issues we'll talk about with using online services though is a lack of reliability. And so we asked how often do you have problems with streaming TV shows and movies <clears throat> like buffering, interruptions, low quality when you are watching video online. And as you can see, it's uh, you know, about a third in the, in the middle age ranges here that say that they run into problems uh, half the time or more. And these are people who are watching at least weekly. So while these uh, online services, over the top services, uh, create new ways of finding content, have new and different interfaces, they still have their technical issues as well. So with that, to uh, kick things off, I'll flip back to the uh, panel overview. 
<clears throat> and I will uh, start out by asking the panelists, you know, what are your uh, reactions to some of those consumer trends? What, what's at the root of some of the behaviors we're seeing? Where do you think the challenges and opportunities are in over-the-top video? Yeah, Richard. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Jonathan. So I think um, a lot of the trends that you were talking about um, are things that are being driven by consumers wanting more convenience um, and wanting to um, watch the content uh, when and where they want to watch it. Um, I think companies like um, Prime, Amazon with Prime Video and others are helping to drive that type of um, kind of consumer expectation such that um, increasingly people are watching content on demand. And um, many times people are binge watching programming that they like. And so um, that kind of shift in terms of consuming um, you know, on your schedule versus on a program schedule is something that we think is going to continue to happen. The other big part of, I think, what is um, driving a lot of adoption in OTT services is the notion of convenience. And so um, what we see with our video service and what our customers are doing is, while you can imagine um, a significant percentage of um, streaming activity, watching happens on the biggest screen in your house, um, a significant portion of total viewing is actually on mobile, um, on a phone, on a tablet. Um, part of it is through uh, features so you can download Prime Video content, for example, if you're going on a flight or if you're you know, going to be in a car and you want your kids in the back to do something. Um, but it's that increased convenience, I think, is playing a big um, kind of factor in driving this shift as well. So convenience watching on other devices, which, you know, there was this uh, TV everywhere effort that traditional providers attempted to push. But, you know, in our survey, it's like 36% awareness and hasn't changed that much over the past three years. So <clears throat> the, the uh, ability to download and watch in other ways other than the living room, uh, clearly a big part of this. Yeah, I think TV everywhere. Um uh, has an awareness problem more than anything else. It doesn't really have a usage problem. I mean, usage, I think, is, is pretty high. We, we saw from the Olympics um, both four years ago and, uh, and again this year that, um, uh, you know, the only way to watch uh, uh, the Olympics on mobile platforms, for example, or um, uh, watch some of the minor sports that weren't, weren't on the major um, NBC networks, the only way to do that was through um, what we call, we in the industry call TV Everywhere. Um, maybe the consumer didn't realize that's what it was called, but um, they wanted to uh, uh, they wanted to watch their fencing or um, uh, you know hockey or whatever it is. So uh, you know they um, figured out through whatever means um, how to uh, how to do that on these um, streaming devices, mobile devices, etc. Uh, so you know, on Sony smart TVs, we uh, we certainly you know, give a lot of attention and placement to um, uh, the TV Everywhere services that we have. You know, we have the full suite of, uh, uh, of Fox apps, Fox Now, FX Now, uh, Fox Sports, etc. So, um, and those are uh, you know because the, because there's still a large number of. Um, a uh, large amount of viewing on of, uh, of live linear content. I mean, live linear still makes up 89% of, um, of viewing, according to a statistic that I, I saw recently. Um, uh, you know, the, those brands that are closely associated with live linear are, uh, are still very important. So, uh, you know, those aren't going to go away just because people spend a lot of time binge watching Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, etc. To kind of seg from the, the binge watching aspect, I, I think one of the things that you know I, I definitely see in our business every day is the changing dynamic from what was a traditional KPI of a certain uh, certain level of audience with a specific piece of content and shifting away from that to the KPIs being around engagement and minutes on a platform. I think um, one of the most drastically changing things that we're seeing is. Um, customizer user specific discovery being uh, a much more important piece. Uh, curation just can't keep up, uh, like uh, an individual human curation can't keep up with a, a, a customizer user specific discovery uh, based on an out, based on algorithms. So, 
uh, you know, when we do A-B testing around implementing certain tools for our partner managers to curate certain series or certain pieces of content, you know, we, we do want to drive to specific types of content, but in the, at the end of the day, if you can customize what's being fed based on the user history, uh, you, you end up with a, a more engagement, and that, that is the key KPI for a, a, a platform like ourselves, uh, as opposed to sitting there every day trying to look at the top 10 pieces of content uh, and what their audience is, which is not nearly as, as important as, as minutes viewed per, per user. And are you seeing more, um, you know, there's kind of discover, curation is one thing, right? Then there's uh, discovery, and then there's actually kind of recommendations based on individual needs and, and preferences. What, what have you seen in terms of advances in the third area, which, uh, you know, may, it's kind of like the, the logical next step after the first two, but what, what are you seeing there? You mean user recommendations? Yeah, recommendations. Yeah. Is, that, is that really working? <coughs> or, is, or is discovery, personalized discovery, a better approach, would well, you say? Well, in the last 10 years, I mean, the main thing that I've seen is, uh, uh, 10 years ago, I was at AOL, and we were creating a ton of content. And there was times where uh, I'd be working with a producer, and, and there would be no metadata associated that after they had uploaded, we were using Brightcove at the time, it's before, um, before they purchased uh, Five Min. And, and you know, they would upload series and there was gonna, a lot of curation on home pages and, and different publishing points on AOL, but they weren't creating <coughs> metadata for that. Now, uh, 10 years later, that would be insane. Uh, and it was insane at the time, actually, but uh, now it would be unheard of, and that's because, obviously, um, like I was talking about, a customized user-specific discovery of what terms they've been searching out to find that first piece of content. You need to be able to feed them uh, associated content, um, and that's all based on, obviously, the metadata that you've associated with that piece of content. So, I mean, in, in the last 10 years, I mean, like you're saying, user recommendations have become absolutely vital. Hmm. Yeah, we've seen the same thing. So um, Amazon, I think, as a company, has been built on generating really um, targeted uh, recommendations based off of not only our customers' behaviors, but also what other customers are doing who are looking for very similar or the same things. And so you guys, I'm sure, have gone to the Amazon website to go buy something and you'll see certain recommendation um, 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 po components of our website where customers who bought this also bought that. Um, we do a lot of quite sophisticated personalization based on all the data we see from our customers in terms of their um, behaviors. Like when they stream content, they stream a particular type of content um, during, um, let's say, the evening versus during the morning, we draw inferences from that. And then we start to figure out um, what content makes sense to surface to that customer based on their previous viewing history, based on what others are doing, based on the time of day that we see it, based on the type of content that, that they're looking at at that time. And so it it's, goes to the core, I think, of what we feel is going to be um, kind of uh, in, in innovation around what the customer experience is, such that you're not just turning something on and kind of um, kind of you have a lean back experience of you know, a static kind of grid or guide. It's more increasingly personalized to what it is that you want to watch and your family wants to watch. In, in terms of um, you know, what's driving OTT and consumer preference, you know, we're talking about convenience, discovery, finding the content you want. What about video quality? You know, every year I love going to CES and looking at Sony's and others' latest uh, displays, and I'm, I'm just always blown away by how the advances that have occurred. Is, is quality still important, you know, with all of this over-the-top consumption happening, or, uh, you know, how do we think about things like 4K and HDR and advances in video displays? It's funny you should ask that, yes. Um, <laughs> we think it's pretty important. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, when we started selling 4K TVs in, in 2012, um, a lot of people at that time said, 
you know, this was all just a scheme by TV manufacturers to, uh, um, to sell more TVs um, and, uh, you know, had nothing to do with what uh, consumers or uh, content creators wanted. Um, I think, you know, 2016, it's, it's pretty obvious that um, that wasn't the case at all. Uh, you know, very quickly, um, Netflix and, uh, and Amazon um, released um, 4K content, which they'd actually been producing. They'd been using 4K cameras for years before that. Uh, so there was already a, an original content library um, building up, um, you know, even in 2013 when the 4K versions of, uh, of Netflix and Amazon launched. And, um, you know, any movie that's ever been shot, um, you know, in the last hundred years can be scanned to, uh, to 4K and look better than HD. So, uh, you know, we're at a point now where, um, although there's not many live linear networks um, in 4K yet, uh, you know, we think that's going to happen very quickly. Um, and there's, you know, if you buy a 4K TV or a 4K, um, you know, streaming player, uh, there's a huge amount of 4K there to, uh, uh, to enjoy. And, you know, now we're kind of building on the, uh, you know, on the 4K um, quality step with high dynamic range, uh, which, you know, gives even, even greater picture quality. It's more like um, looking out of the window rather than looking at a TV screen uh, because of the um, dark uh, to light, um, uh, you know, contrast and uh, improved colors and um, all, uh, all those things. So, you, you know, you really have to, uh, have to see it to believe it. So, uh, yeah, we think, we think quality is um, uh, really important. It's always uh, the primary driver for a consumer buying a new TV set. Um, you know, it comes, comes first uh, before all the other considerations. So uh, to the extent that, um, you know, we can work with the creative community to, um, uh, to, to create more 4K content, you know, that's, that's really what, uh, what Sony's all about with our um, camera business and uh, uh, movie business. Richard, what, you, what are you seeing? Jonathan, I agree. I mean, quality is um, critical. It is so important because when you want to watch something, you turn your TV on or you turn your device on and you just want to watch it. And it's the most frustrating thing to see some kind of error message or some type of spinning wheel um, and you have to close out of an app or something. And so I think for all of the companies that are offering over-the-top services, um, if we don't pay um, incredible, um, uh, if we don't pay attention incredibly closely to quality, we risk um, our customers' trust because they will go elsewhere. TV just works. They want TV to work. And so one of the things that we've seen, um, you know, from an Amazon and, and Prime Video perspective, we put a lot of emphasis on having a very high quality service that does not crash that, um, that is very high quality in terms of the picture quality. Um, and, and it starts very quickly. So you're not waiting for your video to start. Um, it's milliseconds instead of many seconds. And so um, one of the things we've seen with our Amazon Channels program that I referenced earlier is we have over 75 partners today on our service, including Showtime, Stars, Acorn TV, um, History Vault and, and many others. And many of the companies that we partner with have their own direct consumer apps that they offer and that they launch on different platforms, such as on Sony and such as on Fire TV even, our own first party device business. Um, and we encourage that, that's great. One of the things that we've seen though from both customer feedback as well as looking at reviews across all the different platforms is one of the benefits to um, working with Amazon, one of the reasons why these video services work with us is the, we operate the service. Um, they hand over and transfer all the assets to us. And so all of the playback and all of the encoding and all that act, the activity happens um, on the Amazon platform. And so we operate you know, Amazon Web Services, which is the largest cloud computing infrastructure on the planet. And so um, what we see when we look literally side by side sometimes is higher quality of the exact same program through Amazon Video than through um, other sources, potentially even the direct consumer's own service. And so our customers want that high quality, you know, very high uptime type of experience. 
Um, and so that's something that I think we all are going to continue to focus on to make sure we keep. And then to your question about you know, 4K and HD and other kind of new standards, new formats, um, we have to continue to um, uh, enable those, roll those out in ways, um, for us, it's a little bit complicated because, because our, um, our app is across hundreds of devices in the living room and outside the living room. Uh, we need to make sure our code base is such that it can support um, 4K bits um, across all of it. And as, as, um, as Nick knows, it's not easy to do that. So, um, but it's, it's very important, high quality of the service. Anthony, does high quality video come into play for in your world or? Uh... Yes, and I would say um, there's, uh, because I, I'm based in Los Angeles, there's often times where uh, I feel like there, there's a commodification of a, pro of a product and, and, and every player, no matter what it is, is all kind of the same. There's a, a misunderstanding there. I think we kind of, if you take a look at what has occurred with Vessel, because that's recent, that Vessel's been kind of now broken down for its parts. And to, I think looking at Vessel as a case study is, is very interesting. One of the things that I'm not sure they, un they understood, but I'm speculating around this, is understanding the user expectations um, when trying to take content that was on YouTube and, and partners that were on YouTube and transfer it to this new platform. Um, simply by putting con that content behind a paywall uh, and windowing it for a few days, it proved to be not a successful strategy. And there's a lot of different reasons why that may be. One of the things that I feel strongly is that uh, YouTube is a, a lean forward platform. Uh, it's very key for those users to be engaged in a community. Uh, the content is sort of like the sun and the community is the planets sort of orbiting around that particular YouTube creator, YouTube star. Um, when those uh, creators were moved to Vessel and started creating exclusive content, I don't believe that Vessel's product was built out and of the quality uh, that that uh, community requires. Um, if you look at Twitch, one of the reasons that Twitch is such a success is the product, the community tools, the ways people can interact. It's not simply just a place where there's a player and there's a type of content there that people lean back and just watch like they would watch, you know, Netflix or Amazon. It's a, it's a different medium, and, and, and I think there's a, a, an understanding that needs to be there around what the user expectation is around product and the quality of that product. Um, one of the things that we're working on at Daily Motion right now is integrating into the Vivendi family, and in the US, obviously, a big part of that is working with Universal Music Group and their uh, numerous music labels. So currently, we're working with folks like um, Ty Roberts, who's their new CTO. You probably know him from Grace Note. He's now over with UMG, about understanding what the expectation is for an audience that's coming to a platform to consume music content. Um, uh, there, it's a very different, um, uh, it's a very different sort of experience that they're looking for as far as the tools, playlisting tools, uh, um, uh, recommendation uh, algorithms that are expected so they can be fed the next type of music that they may be looking for or may not know that they're looking for. Um, so that's one of the things that we're really trying to do as we are building out our platform for the Vivendi family is understanding what spe the specific uh, partners need based on their users' expectations. And it sounds like there is this uh, divide almost between more lean-in experiences and lean-back experiences where, you know, if it's a lean-in experience, then a more interactive device is a, a, the place where you would generally have to consume that. If it's lean back, you could experience it across a variety of platforms as long as you get that, that user experience uh, right. And um, so you, I, I think the takeaway is that know what kind of an experience you're uh, trying to create and does it uh, serve the user needs and the content itself <clears throat> and the content provider's needs. Absolutely. Well, with all these um, 
benefits of uh, interactivity and new platforms. What are some of the pain points and challenges for consumers in today's video world? You know, beyond the reliability problems that we talked about, you know, what are what are some of the challenges in having a great user experience? So what, what could you imagine being different to make a, a better con consumer experience uh, overall? Yes, yeah, so as far as, a, as a, speaking as a TV manufacturer, uh, you know, we're always um, looking for ways to make um, the lean back, the 10 foot um, uh, user experience um, better. So. Uh, you know, by using the Android TV platform on our um, Sony TVs, uh, we get the benefit of a lot of the technologies that people are already familiar with on uh, on their Android mobile devices. Um, uh, Google Search, so the ability to search uh, across uh, different smart TV apps. You know, that's that's all built in. Um, so you know, you can do that with the TV, with uh, you know, with a microphone in the set or or in the remote control. Uh, so, uh, you know, that um, uh, is particularly appropriate for this, for this lean back um, living room type of, uh, type of use case. Uh, and, you know, just with, with a large number of, uh, of apps that are available um, by using the, uh, the Google Play Store, um, uh, you know, navigation is, uh, is always a challenge. You know, it's, it's harder than uh, just channel up down, uh, which, uh, um, which was the you know the navigation cha challenge of, uh, of 10 20 years ago uh, but you know with uh, with search and with um, faster user interfaces uh, you know, that's that's improved a lot and uh, uh, you know every every year we're looking at uh, how we can how we can take that to the next level but it sounds like the challenge behind it is that all of these different apps from content owners and distributors may have different user experiences. And from a consumer perspective, if you don't have some way of searching across these, that it actually can create a very awkward and frustrating experience, particularly when rights issues are mixed into this. Um, you know, Looking for prior episodes in the current season or earlier seasons, are you seeing any changes in trends for rights, either negotiations or um, you know, a agreement across the value chain that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Richard, are you seeing that? I, I, well, so I think the, I, the answer is yes. You see some, a lot of um, activity by video platforms, whether they're software-based like Amazon Video or whether they're hardware platforms, to try to make that user interface better, to try to make it easier for people to discover the content that it is that they want to watch. Um, I think there's a lot of great content out there, and that's a great thing for consumers. The challenge is how do you find it, and how do you find it in a way that isn't confusing? And so there's so many you know, um, places to go get that content today, and in our service, it's you know, magnified because in addition to having the ability to go buy a movie, you can actually watch it if it's available, if you subscribe to a Netflix um, you know, on a Fire TV or a, a Hulu or Prime Video might, may have that content. And then you layer on top of that the third party um, video channels that we have as well. And so there's just so much information to um, try to make sense of. And so I think um, a variety of companies are trying and making some headway and innovating on what that customer experience is going to be. I think a lot of it, though, is what content gets fed into that um, kind of discovery mechanism. You know, Apple announced. Um, uh, a product aiming to try to simplify the experience so you're not navigating multiple different apps and having to log in and log out. Um, and I think that's an interesting path. That's what Amazon Video, quite frankly, is. We have one app, one experience. Um, the challenge with Apple is they don't have all the content, including you know Netflix and Prime mm -hmm. Video, kind of most notably. Um, but I think there are other ways to innovate as well. Uh, Nick was alluding to kind of voice. We've made um, significant investments around the customer experience on innovating with voice. So if those of you guys have, um, have Echo devices in their houses or, um, or Echo Dots, the small little hockey puck one, my kids love them. They're, you know, I see all the queries and stuff, and it's half jokes, half music, and other trivia. But um, we, we're looking at how we can use um, voice as another very natural way 
instead of navigating some um, remote control that either has too few buttons or too many buttons um, to be able to watch something that you want. And so I think the work is not done. I think there's a lot of work to be done to make it even easier for consumers to just watch what they want to watch, mm -hmm. find what they want to watch. Mm -hmm. So I wish Sherry Brennan were here, unfortunately. Uh, she was ill and had to cancel this morning uh, from Fox. But uh, direct to consumer, whether it's a channel, whether it's a you know, cable network or collection of networks more broadly, what are the challenges and opportunities there uh, for content providers seeking to go direct to, over the top to consumers? And you know, obviously, there are, there's some opportunity, but what do you see as the challenges for those players? Yeah. So um, you know, we have partners, as I mentioned earlier, who have their own direct consumer services, and they're investing in them, and they're doing well with them. I think the challenges are really twofold. The biggest challenge, I think, is um, standing out from the crowd. How do you get your service um, noticed by, um, by consumers when there's hundreds, if not thousands, of choices of apps to consume and, and content to watch? And so the discovery in getting um, kind of customer acquisition, I think, is one really big challenge. Um, if you are a huge brand, um, I think you, know, you get um, a lot of benefits from that. But if you're not you know, a, a, a large brand that's going to be instantly recognizable by a, you know, the typical consumer, I think it's just a little bit harder to stand out, especially you know, the internet was made for breadth of selection, right? So whatever it is you want to watch, Whatever it is you want to buy or read or consume, you should be able to go get because bandwidth, hopefully, unless you're capped, is, is, should be relatively unlimited. And so um, with that in mind, you, know, you would think that niche services would do really well. Niche games would do really well. But I think it's been really hard to break out, to hit the top you know, echelon. And so I think customer acquisition is the first challenge. And then the second challenge, I think, um, is what I alluded to earlier, which is maintaining a high quality of service. When you have, in particular, linear programming that is very popular, like um, a Super Bowl for an obvious example, but other high um, you know, demand, highly viewed programming, um, I don't know that um, there is a lot of um, history of over-the-top players being able to scale in that way that the cable and satellite companies have done so for decades and done very well. And so that's a challenge that um, I think direct consumer services have, when they have a popular show, HBO had um, some outages um, in the last mm -hmm. season of Game of Thrones. Um, and I think it's, that is a challenge that will continue to be um, something that service providers need to deal with. Yeah, so lack of awareness, you know, spending. What, one of the things we see is that anyone who's contemplating an over-the-top service uh, focuses on, all right, we've got to make it work. We got to, if we don't own the content ourselves, we have to get the rights. So you've spent money in those two buckets, but then a lack of recognition of how expensive it is to generate awareness, uh, have the, the sales infrastructure to actually uh, acquire customers. And then you've got churn on the back end. Like what's the, the it's very low switching cost for consumers to subscribe and then unsubscribe and then resubscribe if they want to, whereas in a cable TV service, there's, some, there's that box as well as truck rolls and mm -hmm. other factors that make, it, uh, make those switching costs much uh, higher for consumers. <clears throat> um, what have you seen as effective ways that content providers have actually generated awareness? Like how do you get a well-known brand? How do you make consumers aware that the app exists? Is it, is it by having an app, or is it by in being included in a platform? You know, perhaps, uh, Anthony, what you're seeing. Well, I mean, there's the obvious piece, which is uh, you know, creating a community on a popular social media platform um, can start to build a, you know, basically a marketing arm for yourself and, 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 and spreading your, your footprint to other platforms. Um, I, I think what the challenge is right now, and I think a lot of uh, I think a, a lot of people are talking about this, especially when we talk to partners, is that um, people are creating massive audiences on Facebook and YouTube, and they're not really making a ton of money there. 
um, in a lot of cases. And um, they're trying to bring that audience to other platforms where they can create actual revenue. Um, I think the thing that makes it difficult uh, is the how primitive um, the ad environment in the digital space is currently. Um, I think uh, all ads currently, uh, from the data that I see on a daily basis, uh, 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 restrict the ability um, to engage the user. Um, people are avoiding ads as much as, as they can. And they're always, I, I feel strongly, now I work for an AVOD platform, but I feel strongly there will always be AVOD monetized content. And that's simply because it's a low threshold for entry. And um, you know, if you're creating something new that people don't have any sort of reference point for, they need to be able to get through an ad to be able to consume that content. What I think is going to happen, and I hope happens over the coming years, is there is a collaboration between the SSPs, between the, the platforms, and between uh, storytellers, where you start to create ad formats that, instead of actually um, hurting engagement, that they actually create engagement because the, the uh, ad formats and the ads themselves um, are actually appealing to the user. Um, now, we've seen little, um, now I, I think this is because it's short form, but we've seen, like for instance, five second in-stream advertising from Geico on mm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it also, they use, uh, you know, we have that ad format on Dailymotion as well. There's also, uh, you know, different um, uh, user customized uh, ads based on obviously past history and browsing. Um, so I think as I think we're at a very pr primitive state still, and I think over the coming years, if that collaboration can happen between uh, the ad ad tech community, the platform community, and storytellers themselves, uh, that we can eventually find a way where uh, where AVOD platforms aren't constantly battling the fact that they're serving ads. So the Geico ad <clears throat> is uh, not exactly a collaboration with a storyteller, but uh, have you, uh, have you well, seen I, any? I, I would it, say that there it? are people within agencies that are storytellers. Uh, ah, you okay, know what I mean? The, so that the ad itself is, is a story. Yeah. Okay. That's got what it. I kind of mean is like, got you it. know, f f advertisers as storytellers creating engaging um, ads or branded content or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and there's lots of examples where you know, the ad is um, strongly integrated into the, uh, into the content, um, uh, maybe not directly, but um, at least, uh, you know, appealing to the same target customer and um, of a format. I mean, comedians in cars getting coffee is a good, good example mm, from, yeah. uh, from Crackle, mm. yeah. where um, you can't really see the ad breaks. For the most part, uh, though yet, Jerry is kind of funny yeah. about it sometimes. So but I actually yeah. mentioned the he car actually mentions that. Street. Oh, what's that? Uh, in, uh, <laughs> yeah. What's that Acura doing here? You yeah. know, it's, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's it's done in a way that is not um, uh, not something that uh, people want to just fast forward through. You know, and that's uh, that's clearly a a key part of the recipe of um, uh, of, of getting uh, uh, the kind of engagement that you want in in this type of content. Hmm. So what, um, what do you see as, you know, if content providers able to go direct to consumers, new platforms aggregating engaged users, what are the challenges for traditional service providers? And what do you see that traditional service provider, meaning cable operator, you know, satellite TV, traditional MVPDs, what do you see as the challenges for them? And what, is their, what are their opportunities to, to um, adapt to these changing consumer needs and interests? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time talking to these uh, traditional MVPDs, um, uh, you know, trying to encourage them to, um, you know, to move away from uh, delivery via a set-top box to delivery via uh, a smart TV. Uh, there's really nothing that the set-top box can do that the smart TV can't. Um, uh, so it should all be um, upside for them to uh, uh, to deliver their um, bundle of, uh, of programming through a smart TV, and uh, you know I think we're we're starting to see that now. It's taken um, longer than uh, 
than we might have expected, but uh, I think we're, uh, we're starting to see that, and a lot of cable companies investing in the cloud infrastructure that's necessary to, uh, uh, to make that work, as well as, the, uh, uh, as, well as building the apps. Uh, so, you know, that, um, that should be a way uh, for them to um, make themselves more um, relevant and appealing to, uh, uh, to customers who are perhaps tempted to switch away and cut the cord or trim the cord and go to uh, uh, Netflix, etc. Cool. I agree. I think um, the two things that the cable companies and the MVPDs can do to really um, um, kind of maintain customer trust is to innovate on the customer experience. I think that's um, first and foremost. I think some companies like Comcast have done a good job with X1 really um, kind of reimagining what um, the TV viewing experience can be. But I think there's still a lot of work that can be done there. Um, and I think the second thing is um, innovating on consumer um, offerings. I mean, Jonathan, you talked about the packaging. Um, and we read studies um, seemingly you know, every week or so about consumers being frustrated with paying for 180 something channels um, and not having flexibility. And so um, kind of the industry pushing for more flexibility is I think gonna be the, um, one of the key things for the, um, the MVPDs to um, remain relevant. Yep. I had a uh, technology failure here. I had a timer that was gonna say, all right, now time for audience <laughs> questions here. <laughs> uh, but I think, um, do we have time for a couple, Jose, or uh, no? All right, sorry everybody. Um, well, we're here, we'll be around, so ask us questions, and please join me in thanking our uh, panel.